Hi everyone, welcome back to the Kagan Dunlap channel. Today we've got a very interesting video that's coming out of Russia of an American who defected to Russia. I'm sure that you guys are already tracking on this because I made a video about this particular individual, I think a couple of months ago, because there was footage coming out of Avdivka of this guy in Avdivka. Now this dude is former Air National Guardsman who fled to Russia. Now this guy's name is Wilmer Puelo Mota. He's 28 years old. He's a former security forces technical sergeant with the Massachusetts Air National Guard. He fled the U.S. at the beginning of the year and appeared in videos and social media posts in April claiming that he was intent on joining Putin's army after already having helped fight in a key city in eastern Ukraine. Like I said, he came out and was in a bunch of videos in Avdivka, like talking about stuff. And there's an earlier video on my channel. If you wanna watch that stuff, you can check that out. I'll link the video at the end of this video so that if you wanna watch it, you can. The guy says that he's not a traitor, apparently. This guy fled the country after he came up on child charges. And then he left to go join the Russian military as like a drone operator. Anyway, let's watch the video and then you guys can decide what you think of it. Uh, so I'm Will. I'm from Massachusetts, Boston. That's right. Yeah. My call sign, Puzzles 9, Boston. Yeah, it's where I'm from. So I said, why not? I'll go. My call sign is Boston. Yeah, the guys get a laugh out of it. They get a kick out of it. Yeah. <laughs> the well, guys think it's we were funny. sitting down and trying to figure out what my passive noise should be. And one of them said, oh, you're from Boston. It should be Boston, Boston. I was like, OK, no, I like it. I like it. Yeah. So like I said, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and I served 10 years in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, some years in the Massachusetts Air National Guard. Like I said, the guy served in the Air National Guard in Massachusetts. You know, he served for 10 years before he left the country. And when I got involved in politics, I zoomed out into the international level of politics. Uh, and you really kind of stop and pause and think about what's going on here. And, you know, you feel like you have to do something about it. He said that he's become interested in politics because of being like part of the city council. And that made him interested in politics. He neglects to mention anything about the fact that he had the child charges against him and that he fled the country shortly after those came out and i served there for three months and then after that i had some friends that went on to serve with the ministry of defense the 137th brigade where we're here and they said well come on come on it's great and come on come on it's great i'm sure everybody knows at this point like just from seeing the footage out there in ukraine of guys getting chased by drones at night and during the daytime and like people are getting blown up and just absolutely like you know trench lines getting charged and like sitting in like trench warfare they there does nothing about this war in Ukraine looks like fun. Fun's probably not how I would describe it. I had academic training. I was an E6, it's a tech sergeant. Uh, you know, my job was air-based defense. It's military, police, security forces. He was an MP. So security forces in the Air Force is an MP. I don't know what it is about MPs. Like, I've got a lot of friends who are MPs. Like, there's some good people that come out of being MPs, but sometimes there are some folks that come out of there too that are just like, man, they need a helping hand. You feel me? Yeah, well, I mean, look, the, I, I've heard that question come up a lot. And what I say to that is the United States and Russia are not at war. So he's right. The United States and Russia are not at war. They're not at an open war. It's kind of like uh, we're supplying Ukraine with weapons and ammunition, and armaments, and helping train them, and then Russians are fighting the Ukrainians. It's like a proxy almost. Same thing could be said of what we did in the 1980s when the Russians were in Afghanistan, and we were supplying them with weapons and training. Pretty much the same thing. We're not directly fighting them, though. Hopefully, people understand that like this whole thing, it's going to be more beneficial to everyone if we can all like get along with each other and find some sort of way to peace that should always be preferable regardless of like who you are what side of the aisle you're on or what country you're from everybody should be like interested in having some sort of peace it's been involved in other people's uh, politics, other nations' interests, and, and, and should not be doing that. I always say, and Sergey Lavrov said this uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think that the country is ran by different people than the people that live in the country and feel a different way. I think it's important for, I mean, we've got an election coming up in the United States. I think it's important for people to just do their own research and kind of read about things from independent news outlets and understand what's really going on here. Understand that this started back in 2014 with our politicians coming down here and saying all sorts of different things and making all sorts of different promises. Now, what he's talking about in 2014 is there's some big civil strife in Ukraine during that period of time. A lot of folks would say that there's like a crisis in Ukraine in 2013, starting November of 2013, when President Viktor Yanukovych rejected a deal for greater integration with the European Union, which sparked 
sparked mass protests across the country, which he attempted to put down and it ended up getting violent. Now, a lot of folks try to say the dude was a plant from Russia. Now, I don't know for sure. Bottom line is he was like backed by Russia. Like Russia was cool with him being there in that position. In February of 2014, anti-government protests ended up toppling the government and then ran Yanukovych out of the country. And then Russia was trying to like salvage their lost influence out there. And then they invaded and annexed Crimea the next month. Then April, pro-Russia separatist rebels began seizing territory in eastern Ukraine. The rebels shot down Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 on July 17th, which resulted in the deaths of 298 people, probably accidentally, probably not on purpose. And then fighting between like the rebels and the Ukrainian military kept going, kept intensifying. Eventually the rebels started to lose. And then in, in August, the Russian army overtly invaded eastern Ukraine to support the rebels. This brought the relationship between Russia and the West to its like, you know, lowest point since the Cold War. Sanctions are pushing the Russian economy to the brink of recession and more than 2,500 Ukrainians lost their lives during that piece of time. Bottom line is that during this period of time, they had that pro-Russian president who got ran out of office and then they had kind of like a quote unquote civil war. That's what he's referring to when he's talking about 2014. You know, it's not, what, what benefit is it for the United States to have million, multi-million dollar tanks rolling down here trying to kill people? You know, missiles firing at a beach of innocent people. You know, what, what interest is that? F-16s, there's no interest to that. You know, our country is trillions of dollars in debt. Our country's collapsed and it's falling apart. And, you know, it's just not, in my opinion, representative of the real interests of the American people. So when I when I hear that question, you know, I, I don't consider myself a traitor. The United States and Russia are in that war. All right. So when he was talking about missiles landing on the beach, he's talking about missiles landing on the beach at Sevastopol and Crimea. And that was Ukrainian missiles that were potentially provided to them from the U.S. Potentially. I don't know for sure. Anyway. That's what he was talking about with that. I think that the people that caused this in my country should be held responsible for what they've done. And we can have some sort of friendship between Russia and the United States. Yeah, of course. I mean, I've, you know, I've worked downrange with these guys, like we say in the U.S. military on the front. And I absolutely like trust we say them in the U.S. military. And I know for a fact that they trust me as well. What, what I always tell people is because this this also this is a question that comes up in the U.S. military. It's about the people that you're with. It's about the people that, you know, you're serving with, because this isn't you know, this is to be realistic. This is a dangerous situation. You know, we're all down here serving. We're doing our job. But what makes it or breaks it? is the people that you're with and you know these guys have been great they speak english they're professionals uh, you know they help you when you need it if i don't have something or if i don't understand something i'm like oh boss i need this or that like here's the thing i'm sure and this is true for every country there's good people and there's bad people in every country's military it doesn't matter if you're in ukraine or if you're russian or if you're from the czech republic if you're from america if you're from china if you're from afghanistan if you're from iraq if you're from iran if you're from israel everybody has good people and bad people so i'm sure that there are some good people in the ukrainian military and there's probably some good people in the russian military there's also probably some bad people in both sides he's had a very interesting and unique experience because i also heard a story about a guy from texas that got tortured to death inside of an abandoned mine by russians using an old field phone i'm sure that there's probably going to be varied experiences depending on who you are how useful you are to people and the relationship that you built with them now obviously this guy was prior military in the united states so like that's a valuable thing to have as a you know a foreign nation especially for propaganda which what this video is essentially for it's a propaganda video this only benefits them i think this is an interesting video because you know i wanted to hear what he had to say and like you have to take stuff with a grain of salt and you have to like realize okay what's the purpose of this video this video didn't get released by accident no they were like we're gonna shoot this video and then we're gonna release it it's gonna have a psychological impact on people because it's an american anyway let's keep going they helped me to deal with um you know my girlfriend you know then they helped me to navigate you know all the complexities and the cultural differences and again it's it's about the people that you're here with and i couldn't pick a better group of people to be here with. Oh, well, it was a joke. It started uh, back when I first got here. They were introducing me and they said, oh, it's an American. I said, yeah, Ruski. And then after that, they laughed. And now everybody says, oh, yeah, he's Russian-American. But uh, no, I, I love these guys. They're too kind. And, you know, I, I appreciate the the warmth and, and the openness that they've had for me. I can't express. I can't express it. Yeah, mm. it's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, it's propaganda, right? It's... It's, uh, yes, that's you know, correct. I, it I is heard propaganda. This quote so many times, uh, whoever wins wars gets to write the history about them. And unfortunately, on that side, there hasn't been enough liberation yet. 
Uh, so, I mean, they say what they want and people believe it. And it's unfortunate the mainstream media. And the there hasn't been enough liberation yet. I'm confused on that side. I'm not sure if he's talking about America or if he's talking about Ukraine. Here's the thing. The Ukrainian situation is obviously very complicated. There are some regions in Ukraine that dating back to like 2014, like when you, when I was talking about the 2014 civil strife that they were having, a lot of the Eastern regions in Ukraine, a lot of them are pretty pro-Russian. Like there's a lot of like, you know, they speak Russian out in the far Eastern side. Like they probably feel more closely tied to Russia. I think personally, if I had to guess, the, the easiest way to come to a peace agreement is Ukraine to be like, okay, look, we will leave you guys this peace, but that means that you need to allow us to maintain our own sovereignty. There may be other areas that are more pro-Ukrainian that Russia has control over that they would potentially want to do like a swap for or something like that, and maybe change the borders. It's not going to be an easy situation because obviously there's been so much death and destruction and now there's so much animosity between between the two countries you gotta sit down and talk about it if you don't sit down and like figure a way to talk about this stuff like it's never gonna happen you know where was the outrage you know you think about the horrible attack that happened on the beach where was the outrage of the terrorist attack that happened again he's talking about sevastopol's beach in crimea and the attack in kursk that just happened I mean, it's a terrorist oh, yeah, attack a 28 year old pregnant woman died i saw i think we've all seen that it's not a, a terrorist attack it's not intended to incite terror among civilians it's like an act of aggression obviously like it is an in Incursion, like the Ukrainian military is in Kursk. I've also seen videos in Kursk of like Ukrainians handing out food to the local folks out there. Definitely a lot of civilians have died from both sides and both sides are pushing their own propaganda. There's always gonna be good things that each side might have done at some point and bad things that each side might have done at one point or at some point. This is what I was talking about when you know I made my decision. Oh, what should I say? Anyway, I saw this video come out a couple days ago and I I thought it would be important or at least pertinent to talk about because this is like, this guy right here is the, the number one defector that people have been talking about. Just cause he's like, he's well-spoken. Dude served in public office in Massachusetts, served in the military in the United States and is actively making videos. Like I said, the last time I saw a video, this guy was back in April. That was back when FDFka was being taken by the Russians. It's interesting to see like what kind of stuff they put out. I don't think it's like super blatant propaganda, but they're just like, hey, look, talk about whatever, however you feel. I'd be curious to hear what everyone else thinks about what he's saying and what everyone else thinks about the situation situation with Kursk. Very complicated situation, but I appreciate you guys watching. I hope that we gain some information out of this and I hope that we all learn something together and we'll see you in the next video.